Um, I was asked to get a second organization on the broker um, and I thought this is clearly just a way of finding out whether the Germans are doing at a meeting on the economy. So I thought I'd start maybe with this. And so I went for JSN. We are uh, actually a small company owned by the German state. And we advise um, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development on yeah, different issues. And also implement projects around the world in the of um, the of 20,000 people working for the organization. So if you've met somebody from us somewhere, this is not a coincidence. Um, yeah, so Germany is not famous for its extensive coastline, but two thirds of our um, partner countries in the cooperation and development world are coastal countries or islands. So the blue economy is really high on the, on the priority list there. And then in the fisheries agriculture group, so I'll be only talking about fisheries now. Um, so far, from our perspective, the blue economy really means it's an opportunity, it's a chance. It's a very innovative job. It's really, yeah, this is an opportunity. Um, SDG 14 is an opportunity for us to reach SDG 1 and SDG 2. So it's really about poverty reduction and it's about uh, so say, securing, securing food um, for the people. So when you give a presentation these next two days and you have the SDG 14 and it's not linked to SDG 1 and SDG 2, um, I will get up and complain. So it's really, <laughs> this link which makes it really um, important. And maybe also when you talk to policy makers, it seems really the same uh, which has been made often. Um, and then, so I said, it's fisheries, sure aquaculture, and then of course the value change, these are the different sectors we're looking at. And then we have a particular focus on African countries and food securities and jobs. So I focus there very much on the outcome of it, no? Jobs, food, that's what we want. Um, of course, we need the ecological. Um, yeah, the ecological basis for it. Um, but then it's also about the process of how to get there. So it's not only about what can we reach, but also how do we get there. And this process focus. Um, and then this process that's particularly important for us at the moment is uh, a focus on the on, yeah, vulnerable groups. This is maybe not a surprise for you, for example, uh, gender issues and value chain. But then also we have um, a big priority on working conditions and social criteria. This is an area where we have been cooperating with GSSI and the Royal Stewardship Council. Um, then also illegal uh, fisheries, illegal fishing, and the issue of, the, uh, of subsidies. So these are some yeah, ways of how can we get to these desired outcomes. Um, and I really envision this, or I envision this, some circles which align in each other. So we have the outcomes, we have the process, how to get there. And then around this process is how do we get to these processes. And that's really about uh, working together on you know, different levels uh, on the projects uh, with stakeholders in the countries, but also on a higher policy level, and then also yeah, with different actors. So this multi level, multi actor agreement. And then we have these three centric circles. There's another circle around, and there are people talking around these three circles inside. And I think that's what we are doing um, today and tomorrow, talking about these issues. And hopefully, if the circle model is of any use, um, what happens in the outer circle also has some effect on the inner circles. So I hope very much this is not just yeah, talking about issues we are already concerned about that it also has some effect um, in the long term. Um, yes, and maybe, uh, yeah. yeah, just to end, so I'm really here to hope the next day is, um, yeah, yeah, just to learn a lot about the work you're doing, to get some updates on some ongoing project, particularly the Thomas project, but also on the other exciting things which are happening. Um, yeah, and maybe there's a game changer somewhere, uh, some great ideas. I just transitioned from science to this policy area, and I always thought nobody in the policy area gives really a lot about what we are doing. Um, and obviously there's a lot of interest really on different levels uh, in the policy area about really good ideas, which also can be applied in a, yeah, which are in reality. So if you have a really good idea, I'm super excited to hear it. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Well, fish for organizations, but I'm also a small scale fisher myself. So that's what I do for a living. So I want to first focus on what I, the impression I have of the blue economy at this time. And um, I have a very deep sense that the blue economy at this time is a serious threat to small scale fisheries. And this has come mainly from the conference in, in Kenya in November, where I saw a very focused effort to influence political will away from small-scale fisheries. Um, so that is the, the current impression. 
Um, what I think blue economy should be is I think blue economy should be fishers including other sectors and not the other way around. Um, we see fishing as being an age, uh, Asian um, profession and um, as such when we introduce new business there should be no negative impact to the fishery sector, that's the first point I really want to bring across. And what does this mean in the world for that? I think we can focus some attention on the issues of how do we improve fisheries um, to support the realization of the SDGs. Not just SDG 14b, we have many other SDGs that are directly impacted by fisheries, particularly small scale fisheries, which account for as was noted, over 300 million people. And SDGs are about people, yes? So we want to see some focus in that area, improving fisheries to the realization, to promote the realization of the SDGs, and particularly small scale fisheries. And of course, we'd love to have the opportunity to collaborate with some of you, to forge new partnerships, and to strengthen the partnerships that we already have. Thank you. And I've seen remote coastal communities really going quite far in the direction of local governance and demonstrating willingness and ability to manage their fisheries, their coral reefs, their mangroves. Um, we've been supporting Bella Jamaica, which is a Manchester's first locally managed marine area. Um, and just right now, they just launched a fisheries improvement project which engages local fishers, government, local businesses, seafood exporters, and it places community governance right at the heart of their ambitions, um, while also trying to build equity with the supply chain, bringing more revenue that rewards the management efforts. So the Village of Management Association probably spends more time now talking about business and about how they're going to support um, sustainable aquaculture, um, how, they, how they engage with seafood exporters, than they actually do about talking about the rules, the governments, um, where they're going to put uh, no take zones, things like that. But that makes total sense to me. Um, people in that area earn less than two dollars a day, almost entirely from fishing. And yet, by focusing on uh, economic activities that bring tangible benefits in the short term, they've been able to put in place uh, pretty ambitious resource management measures, including no take zones, no seasons, year restrictions. And the the example they set at the national level is starting to be really important. There's now more than 100 locally managed marine areas around the coast, which will take example from these sites and share experiences. And through a network that represents now hundreds of thousands of coastal communities, that they're starting to have a voice at the national level in policy um, and, and gain an influence. So for us, an inclusive blue economy is one that recognizes, enables, and rewards these collaborative efforts at the local level and creates a space for discussion and dialogue, putting, but while always putting the needs of the most vulnerable at the forefront. Um, because they have the most to lose, but also they have a critical interest in securing those resources for future generations. Um, so and we often call these communities small-scale fishers, but as we've been hearing already, uh, the sector is not at all small. It's huge. It engages, involves hundreds of millions of people around the world. Um, and the sector is often overlooked by policymakers, development practitioners over the years. But in this context, the top down approaches are not regularly, they're often failing, they're not quite working. When you get out in the field and you talk to people, it, it's, it's leaving resources prone to exploitation. Um, and what we really need is this kind of bottom up process that we've been witnessing in, in Madagascar. And stuff in other countries as well, through local initiatives um, to empower the people who really depend day to day on those resources for their income, food, cultural identity. And yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing, uh, the, this afternoon is the part that I know the least about from my experiences in the coastal area, so I'm looking forward to hearing about how we can link up some of these processes and learn from different sectors. But we are at a very important crossroads now in terms of our ambitions for a sustainable blue economy. On the one hand, we see that there is great value, uh, significant opportunities um, in the ocean. And the OECD is even now predicting and projecting that the ocean economy will 
double over the next decade, and we're likely to see unprecedented developments in infrastructure, uh, coastal development, in transport, etc., and so on and so forth. Uh, and much of this growth is likely to happen in the global south and east, and can potentially respond to, to many of our SDG ambitions, uh, SDG 1, no poverty, SDG 2, um, no hunger, or, um, and zero hunger even, and SDG 8, uh, decent work and economic development. Uh, but um, on the other hand, as we know, uh, we're seeing many of the indicators of ocean health now in decline. And um, that is leading to essential goods and services being degraded, um, in some cases permanently. And of course this is also now impacting on our ambitions for the SDGs. I think coral reefs, I wanted to um, sort of focus on coral reefs, are a particular case in point. Um, we've lost half our coral reefs over the last 30 years um, with the current projections on climate change. We're likely to continue to lose most of our coral reefs from those sites in the next 30 years, nice and depressing. Um, and the most depressing thought about that is the fact that they are so important to many countries in the developing world, uh, particularly for food security, for livelihoods, but also for coastal protection. And of course there's a great diversity of this because the cost of putting grain infrastructure in uh, would also be excessive. Uh, why not leave the coral reefs where they are? So how can such ambitions for growth be achieved when we're actually eroding the resource base on which such growth will depend? And the business as usual trajectory is actually going to create great risk, um, not just for businesses but also for many hundreds of millions of uh, people in coastal communities around the world. Um, and therefore, it's running counter to the sustainable development goals. Our current, uh, our current business model is running counter to that. Um, so, without influencing the sustainability of the major drivers, we'll not reach our ambitions for a sustainable blue economy. And WWF have um, basically defined a sustainable blue economy on the board there. Um, but put, put simply, our economic growth ambitions are depend, entirely dependent on healthy systems and the goods and services they provide. Um, so we should therefore be simply talking about, we shouldn't, sorry, therefore simply be talking about blue growth, which I'm hearing again and again in meetings all over the world. We need to be talking about minimising risk and building resilience of the ocean, particularly in the face of uh, changing and what I would say very erratic climate. And this will require us to restore many of these systems that have already been degraded before we think about how we're going to exploit them further. And that's going to require substantial investments. We certainly need to stop thinking about marine protected areas as a nice to have, uh, but we need to think about them as part of the overall business proposition going forward to secure national economies but also uh, to secure business um, prospects in the long term. Uh, so more urgently, most urgently, we need to start realigning incentives and capital to, uh, to support our aims, and in particular to re redirect mainstream finance to support a sustainable blue economy. And a shameless advert for our sustainable blue economy finance principles we did with the European Commission, the European Investment Bank, and World Resources Institute. To conclude, <laughs> Um, I think what we, what we really need to do is start using language and articulate cases that resonate with users and in particular the business community, such as the desire to avoid the portfolio of striking assets and to ensure the long term business viability. Um, but whilst we're both talking slightly different languages, or we're all talking slightly different languages, it's increasingly clear to me that we want very similar things. I think the missing link for me is um, the sense of urgency that is now needed across um, all sectors to make sure that we have a sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. Thank you.